Let's start with uh, a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this time together. May we be open and aware and mindful that you are here with us. We thank you for your scripture. And as we open it, we pray that we would hear you speaking to us, that you would lead us and guide us into your word, that we might be people better equipped to love and serve you and those around us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, okay. Can we go around the room and say our names to make sure everyone knows one another? So I'll start. I'm Derek. Janice. Right, Janice. Dale. 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 Jim. Jim. Wonderful. Thanks. So uh, this class is called the Franciscan Bible, Scripture in the Eyes of a Saint. And this is our Bible study with clergy series. So when we say the Franciscan Bible, I want to point out that we don't mean any other Bible. The Bible that you have is the Franciscan Bible. But by Franciscan Bible, in this class, we're going to look at scripture passages that were deeply formative for St. Francis himself and for the Franciscan order, um, and also for the lens of Francis. So this is a Bible study. It's not a study on St. Francis, but along the way, we're going to talk about St. Francis and learn a lot about St. Francis as well. For me, that's relevant because as most of you know, I'm um, a member of the Third Order Society of St. Francis. So I'm a Franciscan. In the Franciscan tradition, there are friars. Those are the first order brothers that wear the robes, the habits, and they take a vow of celibacy and poverty and obedience. Then there are second order cloistered nuns. Those are the women that uh, are cloistered into a community and they spend their life dedicated to prayer for the community. And then there are third order Franciscans. And those are people that live out in the world. They may or may not be married. They may or may not be men or women. They, they could have a job that is not religious at all, but they've dedicated themselves to a way of life that is mindful of Francis's way of, of living the faith of Christ, of, of embodying the way of love. And that's the order that I'm in. So I consider myself a Franciscan. I'm not a friar. I'm what you call a tertiary, which is just means three, the third order. Yes. How yeah. and why are you a Franciscan? How and why? Well, uh, for me, I mean, that's a, I'll keep it short. <laughs> Because I could talk forever about that. Yeah. Um, in college, I felt a drawing towards the monastic life, be becoming a monk. I visited some monasteries and was really drawn to the idea of dedicating my life to a rule of life, a, a specific way of living in community with other people. But also, I was dating a lovely girl <laughs> who I loved very much. And uh, I felt God calling us to get married. And so obviously those two don't quite go together. And so that's when I found out about third orders. And most monastic orders, the order of St. Benedict or St. Helena or all of these different orders of monks and nuns, they have what's called third orders. And those are for people that can't commit or don't feel called to a celibate life in community, dropping everything, but do feel called to a certain ethos or a certain way of living together in community according to a rule of life. So at that point, I started researching what third orders are out there, which one I felt called to. And I met a third order Franciscan when I was a youth minister at a church in Nashville. And we got to talking and I, the, the, uh, the way of St. Francis really resonated with me. And so I joined that order, which means I'm in a community of people, but we don't live together. We get together every few months via Zoom or, or getting together in person. We go on retreats with one another. 
and sometimes we call each other or, or email one another. We pray for one another every day and we all live by a rule of life. And each of our rules of life are adapted to our own circumstances of life and what that looks like. So for me, as a father of two young children, it looks very different than someone who's recently retired and doesn't have any children at home. But we all have certain principles and themes surround around uh, the way of Christ and especially in the way of St. Francis. So I took, uh, I, I went through a period of formation where I was a postulant and a novice. And then in 2015, I made life vows with the Third Order Society of St. Francis. I'll also say that the Third Order Society of St. Francis is an Anglican order. It's, it's part of the Episcopal Church and the Anglican tradition. So there are Catholic monks and nuns and tertiaries, but there are also Anglican monks and nuns and tertiaries. In my order in particular, we have friars that live around the world, and especially in California, there's a few houses there of Franciscan friars that are celibate and poor and live together in community and wear the habit and everything. Uh, yeah. So um, I've got my notes and I've got my PowerPoint and I don't know what, uh, which way to go first. Um, so as I mentioned, this is class not about Francis, but about the Bible. And the reason we're doing it is not only because I like Francis, but also the feast day of St. Francis is coming up on October 4th, which is less than a month away. On the, the feast of St. Francis here at Good Shepherd, we often get together and we have the blessing of the animals, which we will do this year on Wednesday, October 5th, here in the courtyard. We also have a service called the Transitus of St. Francis, which is the day before his feast day, the, the evening before, October 3rd. That's a Monday night, and it'll be a very low-key even song. I'm, I'm just going to pray in the church and invite anyone that wants to pray with me. They can, but it's not a big service. So we are coming up to the season of St. Francis, and so it's an especially good time to think about who St. Francis is and what he can teach us about how to read scripture. So we're looking at passages that are foundational for the Franciscan tradition, but we're also looking at uh, how does Francis read scripture? What is the lens that he uses when he reads scripture? And we'll say more about that in a moment. So who was St. Francis? Any, anyone, what, what do you know about Francis? Was his father a cloth merchant, merchant or something, and he was from a wealthy yep. family? Yep, he was the son of a wealthy cloth merchant in, in Italy. Yeah, yeah. His family were not nobles, but they were maybe the richest people in town because of this successful cloth um, business. Yeah. Anyone else? What What do you know about Francis? I'm kind of remembering it, tell me if I'm right. And he was so opposed to this wealthy life that that's why he left it. Yeah. He was so radically transformed that he went from being the richest boy in town to being the poorest. And he was uh, almost upset. Someone said to me the other day, um, I forget who it was. Someone told me, was it you? No, who was it? That Doug, Father Doug said, Oh, Fran St. Francis was a little bit crazy. Um, and that's, I, I mean, yeah. as most saints are, to be a saint, you got to be kind of out of your mind in some way. Uh, and so Francis loved poverty so much that he would often trade his shirt with someone that had uh, a shirt that was less, uh, that was uh, not as nice as his own shirt. Um, so he was committed to the way of poverty. He called it lady poverty and he, and he, uh, said that he married Lady Poverty, that it was his wife. I think I saw a movie years, years ago. Um, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon? Yes. That's the, that's the famous one, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon. I think that's what it's called. Yes. And it, I, I have it, it was like in the 70s, right? Yes. And so it's very much this kind of hippie telling of St. Francis' life. The music is beautiful, acoustic guitar and yes. flowy. And, yes, it is. That he, that he led a very dissolute life, really, right. early on, and was, was transformed. He went on a crusade, right. he came back, 
suffering for oh, I would probably call it PTSD, didn't it? Exactly. Yeah, he fought he yeah. he he growing up, he wanted to be a knight. That was his his dream. And so he grew up and his dad bought him all of the gear to be a knight. Of course, he couldn't be a knight, you have to be knighted, but he had all of the military gear that was nicer than anyone else. And he went off to war and it was a wake up call and it was a horrifying experience. And he walked away from it with, with PTSD. Yeah. Where did he live whenever he came back? Did he just wander around? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, hope that somebody would him Exactly that. I, I've always heard that St. Francis in association with plants mm -hmm. and living outside. Yeah, he, he was nomadic and the order was, so they did not have their own monastery. And instead they, they depended on the hospitality of others. And at some points in their history, and even today, they have friaries, uh, but they're not, they don't own it it's sort of owned in common or owned by someone else that lets them stay there uh that gives them hospitality but that that was interesting sue you you had something well, to say too i remember i have the statues up my back there's a protector of animals for a while like not just plants but i have all the little animals and i'm mm -hmm. statues yeah and a lot of that comes from a poem he wrote called the canticle of the creatures or canticle of the sun and Francis was someone that saw God in everything, especially creation. And so he would call ant, plants and animals brother and sister. And, and he, he felt that there was a connection between them, that they also were created by God and are God's children in some way. And so he called them brother and sister. And for that reason, he's the patron saint of animals and of the environment, which is why we have the blessing of the animals. Francis, most people know about Francis that he was someone to hold bird baths and love animals and all of that's true frank the legends say that francis preached to the birds he would pick up the worm off the off the pavement and and put it to a safe place you know he loved animals but there was a lot more to his life than just his love of animals of course there were you know John. well little stories about him when he was younger um he had a Boys and girls. Yeah. That's where he met Claire. Yeah. And Claire was one of his best friends. Well, Claire, not at that time. Later, Claire was his best friend. And and I don't know what the movie, the movie shows something, yeah. but Claire was probably 12 years younger than he was, um, maybe a little more than that. And she was a noble that lived in the city. Uh, but yes, Francis, as the wealthiest boy in town, was known for throwing the best parties. Uh, he was a partier, and and Claire knew him as that. And, but when he when he changed and had this conversion experience, that all changed. And he was still a partier. Francis never stopped partying, but all of a sudden it had a different context. It wasn't about self pleasure. It was about serving God and being joyful in God's creation. And Claire, who knew him as this guy that ran around the town throwing parties uh was so moved by his conversion that she wanted that for herself and so she started she was the first woman to join him and she started the poor clares and the women that followed francis weren't able to live that nomadic life out on the streets in the same way it was dangerous for them and so they lived cloistered together in a, a monastery and through the centuries, that's the primary way women have followed the, the life of Francis. They call, they're called the poor Clares. Uh, although today we live in a little bit different of a world. And so there are first order women as well in some traditions that live that way, but all because of Claire and, and her inspiration too. Square to the bishop. The bishop covered him with his cloak. That's exactly right. Yeah. Is it? His his dad was so upset. And of course, when Francis started realizing, oh, I should give away everything to the poor, 
it wasn't his it was his dad's and so he started giving away all of his dad's stuff and his dad was very angry the bishop also was like francis you can't do this some of the priests in town they knew not to take um stuff from francis when he offered it because it wasn't his um and so eventually francis said all right fine here's everything back to you even these clothes are yours and so he took off his clothes and gave them to his dad and says i've always called you my father but now i say our father in heaven and and uh that from then he became a beggar and lived his life yeah yeah he traveled extensively he traveled extensively in fact well i'll just say here he, he was born in 1182 in assisi which is modern day italy to a wealthy cloth merchant family he founded the friars minor which is called uh the little brothers he called them which it was an order all about humility in order with the intent of radically following the gospels literally and we'll talk more about that he was an itinerant preacher so he just traveled around preaching the gospel to whoever would listen whether they be birds or people he would travel around and preach the gospel he spoke out against the crusades and he even um he even traveled to places like egypt in the middle of the crusades and he's famous for having traveled all the way to egypt in the middle of the, the war and crossing enemy lines. And rather than being killed, the Muslims living there that, they, that the Christians were fighting against saw in Francis something holy and they took him to the Sultan and he became friends with the Sultan, Sultan Malik al Kamil. And, uh, and then the Sultan sent him on his way as a friend. And so there's this beautiful story. It's one of my favorite stories. I have a t-shirt with, with this picture of Francis and the Sultan together, uh, but it's a demonstration of loving your enemy and being a peacemaker. So when Jesus says, love your enemy, Francis, as we see here, took that literally. And so he went across the border and met his friend, Sultan Malik al Kamil. And then he uh, learned from the Muslims and, and applied and, and, and adapted his own religious practices to do certain things that they were doing, like praying a certain number of times a day, or um, they had the Muslim call to prayer. And he was so moved by the Muslims that would uh, have this beautiful call to prayer. So he would do the same thing in the Franciscan order when he came back. He was inspired by his, you know, them, which was his enemy, which is incredible. He wanted to be a knight to begin with. Yeah. Really would have been yeah, he uh, you also might not know, but he was very eccentric and creative. And one day he decided for Christmas they wanted to do something special. And so they brought in live animals into the church. And that was the first nativity scene. That was the first live nativity. So today our nativity stories come from the tradition of St. Francis, who, who did that. Lover of animals and nature. He received the stigmata. Uh, you can see in this picture, there's a hole in his hand. The stigmata are the wounds of Christ. He was the first one and only one at that time to have supposedly received the, the stigmata. That's the legend. But he was praying and deep in prayer and meditation on the crucifixion of Jesus and wanted to know what it was like for Jesus to offer himself in that way. And he wanted to offer himself. And so in the prayer, he saw this vision and he, when he came out of it, he had the wounds of Christ and they never fully healed. This was towards the end of his life. So he had the wounds of Christ in his hands and his side, and he kept it very private. Nobody really knew except just a couple of people until his death, when they were preparing the body and they, they found what this said, you know, the stigmata. A lot of people don't believe that, but a lot of people do. That's the tradition. And he died in 1226 when he was 44 years old. He treated his body very badly. And at the very end, he realized that as much compassion and love as he offered others, he did not offer that to his own body and his self. And so he called, he used to call his body brother ass. And, uh, and at the very end on his deathbed, he apologized to brother ass and said, I haven't treated you the way that you ought to be treated. So the Franciscan way that came out of that 
there's, it's a community of people with an emphasis on simplicity and radical dependence upon God, even poverty. Emphasis on poverty and, and, and being poor and simple and depending on others, but also caring for the poor. So the Franciscans are very good at that. Emphasis on nature and finding God in nature. There's an emphasis on interconnection and community that we are all interconnected. We, we belong to one another. Very Christocentric and crucicentric. So for Francis, everything went back to Jesus. His whole life was just mimicking Jesus. He just wanted to be like Jesus in every way, including the cross. Very gospel oriented. And there's an emphasis in the Franciscan tradition as well on the Imago Dei rather than original sin. So some people come to faith saying we are all deeply sinful from our birth and we need God to save us. But the Franciscans say we are all deeply good and beautiful from our birth. And we need a savior because we've forgotten that beauty or we've covered it up with messiness. That sounds like the Muslim argument. In, in some ways, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I I find that really powerful and meaningful rather than focusing on our sinfulness, which he fully acknowledged his sinfulness. Um, also focusing on the deep beauty that is even that comes even before our sinfulness. That goes along with other religions, so it would be easy uh, for other religions mm -hmm. to be attracted to St. Francis. Because most, most religions believe that there is a goodness. There, there is a goodness. goodness yeah. In all of us. Yeah. I, I think in most among the Asians, the Muslims, uh, mm -hmm. everybody. Yeah, yeah, I think that's mostly true, and and that's another thing about the Franciscans that I didn't include that in that list is that the Franciscans are also often tend to be big on interfaith dialogue in ecumenical dialogue. They love talking with people of other religions, and that goes all the way back to Francis himself, right? Who 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 met with the Muslims, Malik Al Kamil, learned from them. He went to try to convert the sultan and found himself inspired by the holiness of that, that man as well. And so he didn't become a Muslim. He knew that the Christian faith was the one that he was called to and believed to be true, but he saw goodness in the Muslim faith as well and learned from it. And so to this day, the Franciscans are the ones that hold the holy places in the Middle East and in Israel and Jerusalem. Yeah, so, so you'll go to Jerusalem and you'll find a lot of Franciscans. You'll find the Franciscan cross made out of olive wood there. Uh, they are the stewards in most places for those holy sites. And part of it is because in all of those years when they were under Muslim rule and continue today, it's a mix of, of a lot of different traditions. Um, the, the Franciscans were the ones that people felt they could trust and work alongside of. The Franciscans were the ones that were able to be with others. And I had a personal experience, I don't know anybody else, <clears throat> of being in Jerusalem. And one of the really is when we were in our own small group praying, when the call to worship, when they're praying, yeah. it's all, if you're hearing you hear it everywhere. It's all going on. Right. It's this amazing city. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. I was in Kuwait for a year and you could hear that every day. And it was very calm. It's powerful. Very um, inspirational. I thought. And uh, five times a day, like everything else stopped. It's no TV. It was like a wedding. I mean, you know, funeral today. Silence. The silence is very awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Thank you for sharing. And in some of those traditions, I don't know if they still do it, but they did in Francis's day. With the call to prayer, there would also be a horn that was blown. They do. Really? Yeah. And so uh, Francis evidently was gifted a horn and he brought it home with him and used it there. And if today, if you go to Assisi, there's in the Basilica of St. Francis, there's a place where you can see some of Francis's things like the habit he wore. And, and one of the things in there is this horn that he carried and received 
from his time uh, in the Middle East and in Egypt. So, but we're talking about scripture. Now today we're talking more about Francis than usual because this is our introduction and it'll set us up for the rest of our class when we get into the, the scripture itself. But the, so I have this question, how did Francis see scripture? What, what, why would we talk about the Bible from a Franciscan lens? Well, Francis had a great love and reverence for scripture a great love and reverence. All saints love scripture. I mean, they're saints. But Francis had just an incredible love for scripture. It was always coming out of his mouth. He had a reverence for scripture, so much so that if he found a piece of paper or something on the ground that, that had a, a little bit of scripture on it or said the word God, he would take it and treasure it and find a safe place to carry it to. He didn't want it to be trampled on. He so deeply, deeply respected scripture. In some ways, you know, today, uh, the evangelical church, evangelical churches, the Baptists, the Pentecostals, um, they're the ones known for loving scripture deeply. They're the Bible oriented ones that are carrying their Bible around. I, I grew up as that. And in, in, uh, in high school, I was the kid that carried my Bible with me everywhere I went outside of my backpack. Everyone knew I had a Bible. They, uh, evangelicals are that way. And in some ways, people, the evangelicals love St. Francis because of how much he loved scripture and how much he memorized it and was always reading it. It was very, very important to him, which I think is helpful for us as we approach scripture. He also primarily saw it as part of worship, especially the Eucharist. So mostly for him, scripture, the context of scripture was reading it in church. Uh, he had it in, in his lips all of the time, but normally he was repeating what he heard in church and his conversion experiences, and we'll talk about this in a moment, happened in church when he was listening to the scripture being read. So he would listen very, very carefully in church to, to scripture, and he saw scripture as, as part of that, that worship and liturgy of the church. Um, he saw... He was really like a soldier in a way because he was fighting for God. So, and soldiers are a bunch of vagabonds. Engineers are too. <laughs> they follow the army and yeah. war engines. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he saw himself as a knight for God. Yes. Although even more, he saw himself as a troubadour or a traveling juggler. Uh, and in those days, there were the folks that would travel around with their, uh, what, is, what, what kind of instrument was that? The lute uh, and, and they'd sing songs and write poetry and just dance. And Fra that, was, that was what Francis really saw his role was walking around and bringing joy to people by dancing and being silly. He would pick up, there are stories of him picking up a, a stick from the ground and pretending to use it as a fiddle and singing and dancing. So he was a soldier of Christ. He saw himself that way. And he also saw himself as a, a troubadour, a juggler, a, a jester for God. And so he, uh, he, used, he saw scripture as poetry and riddle to always be playing with the words of scripture. And to, so it's always on your mouth and, and thinking about it, reflecting on it, being play, playful with it uh, so that it always means something a little different for the context that, that you know, he was in at that moment. He also saw it as his rule of life. When he decided to form the Franciscan order, in those days, if you wanted to be a monk or a friar or a nun, you had to write a rule of life this is what we're going to do as a community. And then you'd bring it to the Pope. And the Pope would read over it and pray over it and say, okay, this is what, this is good. Or he'd offer you recommendations and say, well, you should change this, or this might not be a realistic, or he'd change things. And he'd sign off on it. And that was the rule of life. So they were already in other orders. There were. The, the Benedictine order was the most famous, but there were some other orders as well, yeah. Um, but Francis didn't want to write a rule of life. What was unique to him is he wanted, he, he said, oh, 
the gospels. That's my rule of life. And the Pope said, well, I mean, you got to have a little more than that. He's like, okay. And so he wrote the rule of life, but most of it is just quoting scripture. And so he saw the gospels as whatever the gospels say, that's what I want to do. And that was his rule of life. So this is a book called Francis of Assisi, The Essential Writings. He didn't actually write very much. He was also not an academic and didn't like academic uh, work. So he didn't write a lot, but he did write, a, wrote, he wrote a few things. And this is a collection of some of the things he wrote and his rules are, are in here. And in this particular edition, you'll see on the side, they've put in the scripture passages that he's quoting in each section. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that there's a lot here. You turn the page and all throughout his rule, there are scripture passages. He's, he's constantly citing scripture and most of them are from the gospels. So he saw scripture as, as his rule of life, even if the Pope made him write a real rule of life. And he saw scripture as the voice of God speaking. So that's how he saw scripture, but how did he read scripture? This book, The Gospel According to St. Francis, is by a Franciscan friar, Hilarion Chris, uh, Kistner. And he points out a few different ways that Francis reads, and these will be a great lens for us to read scripture. A lot of people think that they pick up the Bible and they just read it, and whatever it says, it says. But when we read scripture, we're, we're looking at it through a lens, through the lens of what's important to us, through the lens of what we believe, through the lens of our context, the, the 21st century, we can only read scripture through our own understanding, through our own lens. And that's okay, as long as we recognize that we might not have the whole picture. We, not, we might not see the whole thing. I don't know what that sound was. And, and sometimes reading it through a particular lens or seeing it through a someone else's lens is helpful for us to get a fuller understanding of scripture. And so part of this, this conversation is about what was the lens that St. Francis used and what can we learn from the way he read it? Now, obviously we can't fully see his lens because we are not medieval traveling peasants through Italy and Europe and the Middle East. Will never be that. But we can learn certain things about the way he reads scripture. So uh, Father Kistner, the Franciscan, um, he points this out, that Francis read scripture literally. A lot of times you'll hear Episcopalians take pride that we don't read the Bible literally. We read it seriously. Although sometimes we read it literally. <laughs> Uh, sometimes Episcopalians say that, not all Episcopalians, but sometimes you do hear that in the church. Well, Francis read scripture literally. He also read it realistically. So he recognized that context meant that the words changed their meaning a little bit. Not everyone can do exactly what Jesus told his disciples to do, although we want to do it as best we can, according to Francis. He read it personally. He, he believed that it had a personal application for his own life. It wasn't just about learning about the disciples and Jesus, but there was something personally that he could learn from it and apply it. He read it practically, which is similar, but uh, it meant that there was a practice, that there's everything we learn in scripture means that there's a practice associated with it. It calls us into a certain kind of behavior. And finally, he read it spiritually. And by spiritually, I don't mean he read it uh, kind of floating in the clouds spiritually, like that has nothing to do with our body. I mean, he read it believing that the spirit of God is speaking through it. And that's something we could really learn that as we read scripture, we're depending on the Holy Spirit to speak to us through it, to help us understand it and to help us understand how to apply it in our lives today. We need the Holy Spirit to help us read the scripture. Uh, you know, sometimes at different times, 
the same description might mean different things to us because of where we are in life. You think? Yeah, that's absolutely true. I think so. This is the same, same scripture. And that's what's so helpful about Bible studies is when we read a scripture together, someone says, oh, this is what it means to me. And you're like, oh, I never thought of it that way. And someone else says, oh, that's true for me too, but also with this spin. And you're like, oh, I never thought of it that way. So it, it's powerful how the spirit speaks to us in different ways as we read the scripture. So the format of, of this group, oh, it's not. My laptop's dying. I think it'll last though. The, for, the format of this class each week is gonna be very simple. Today, we're doing this long introduction to set us up for the next few weeks. We start with an opening prayer, then we're gonna hear a story about St. Francis that, it has, that it's relevant to scripture in some way. Then we're going to read the related passage of scripture that is relevant to that story. And then we're gonna discuss it. And as we discuss it, um, I thought that I had one more thing on there. As we discuss it, we're going to think about these lenses that Francis used. And so as we read it, we're going to say, well, what, what does it literally mean to us? How do, how, how do we see the literal meaning? How do we see it realistically applied? How do we see it personally applied, practically applied? How do we see the spirit speaking through it? So we'll use this lens in our conversation about those passages of scripture. The schedule, uh, I, w this is a four week study. Four week study, the first week today is introduction. And then we're gonna spend our last few minutes with a story of conversion which starts with the passage from the Gospel of Luke, chapter nine, verses one through six. Next week, we're gonna hear a story about aversion and compassion. So the difference between being disgusted by something and having compassion for that something. And, and that'll look at the Gospel passage chapter uh, of Luke, chapter five, verses 12 through 16. Week three, the theme is perfect joy. We'll hear a story about Francis, about perfect joy, and then read the passage of scripture, the gospel of Matthew chapter five, verses one through 12. And then our final week, which is the week of the feast of Francis, the day after Francis, and earlier in the day before the blessing of the animals, we'll read a story that's about animals. Uh, and the theme is love and enemies. And the passage of scripture is Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. We could go on and tell a lot of stories about Francis. And I had a few other options that I wish that we could cover, but we can't cover everything. So we'll, we'll start with a, with a nice story about Francis. Often I'll just read it and we can pretend like we're in kindergarten and just listen to the story. And then we'll read the scripture. We'll open up our Bible and read a scripture that's relevant to that story. So we've got just a little less than 15 minutes. Uh, so I want to begin with a story about conversion. This book is called The Little Flowers of St. Francis. It's a medieval book. And it's all about the legends of Fr Francis and his followers. I'll show it for the camera as well. The Little Flowers of St. Francis. It was written, I forget, a couple hundred years after St. Francis. And so it's what we call hagiography, not quite a biography. It's a hagiography, which is the story and life of a saint. And often hagiographies, especially the, the, longer, um, the longer time passes after the life of the saint, they become more and more extravagant. So the goal of a hagiography is not to tell history, factual history. The story, uh, the, the goal of hagiography is to tell the story of a saint, whether that be historically accurate or not. There's truth in the story of a saint and what we can learn from, from the life of the saint. So these are the legends of St. Francis that are somewhat extravagant. 
Um, but they also teach us something about the life of France, the life that Francis lived and the life that we can learn from Francis. So the one that I want to point out today is a conversion of Brother Bernard, which was one of the Brother Bernard, which was one of the first followers of Francis. But before we do that, I'll just tell briefly the story. One of, Francis had a number of conversion experiences. One of the conversion experiences is when he was sitting in church and the gospel was read where Jesus sends out his disciples and later sends out the 70 or the 72 and says, don't take anything with you. Don't take an extra cloak and depend on everyone, uh, everyone else for hospitality. Don't even have shoes on your feet. I, I forget exactly what the passage says. And Francis afterwards was like, wow, what was that about? And so after the service, he went to the priest and he asked the priest, what did that mean? Can you tell me? So the priest explained it a little bit more to him. And Francis said, I want to do that. I want to, I want to do exactly that. And so he, that's when he started getting rid of, rid of his things and walking out into the world with only one cloak and nothing else, no other clothing and not even a staff for his hand and lived and depended on the hospitality of others. So, he, and so we're gonna read that passage of scripture. But once he started doing that, other people started seeing him and they were inspired by this guy who had nothing and yet was the most joyful guy in town that just praised and loved God despite the fact that he had nothing. One of the people that were, was so deeply inspired by him was a guy named Bernard. And Bernard was a wealthy, wealthy man. And so he brought Francis over for dinner one time and they talked and, and Francis stayed there together, uh, stayed the night with him. And Bernard saw him in the middle of the night, uh, Francis praying all night long, just praying joyfully and lovingly and excitedly. And Bernard was inspired. And so Bernard said to Francis, I want to live the life that you're living. So Francis says, well, let's go to church and see what the scriptures say. And that's where our story begins today. They therefore went to the bishop's church. And after they had heard mass and had prolonged their prayers until terse, the above mentioned priest took up the missal at the request of St. Francis and the Lord Bernard. And having made the sign of the cross, he opened it three times in the name of Christ, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first time he opened it, there appeared the words that Christ said in the gospel to the young man who asked him about the way of perfection. It said, if you wish to be perfect, go sell all you have and give to the poor and come follow me. They closed the book. The second opening, there appeared those words which Christ said to the apostles when he sent them out to preach. Take nothing for your journey, neither staff, nor wallet, nor bread, nor money, wishing thereby to teach them that they should place all their hope for support in God and concentrate entirely on preaching the Holy Gospel. And they close the book. And they open again. At the third opening of the Missal, there appeared those words which Christ said, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And when they had seen these words, St. Francis said to the Lord Bernard, that is the counsel which Christ gives us. So go and do perfectly what you have heard. And blessed be our Lord Jesus Christ, who has deigned to show us his gospel way of life. On hearing this, the Lord Bernard immediately went and brought out all his possessions and sold all that he owned. And he was very rich. And with great joy, he distributed it all to the poor. That's the conversion of Bernard. Uh, 
We do actually. We know about Bernard, and Bernard followed the way of Francis and Christ, and he lived a life of poverty. He didn't gain his possessions again. He became one of Francis's best friends, and they lived in poverty together, begging on the streets together. Sometimes that meant that they were eating by some gracious rich host, and sometimes that meant they were sleeping outside in the rain like homeless people and they didn't eat uh and that was the life that they lived bernard was um was one of the first followers of francis and became one one of the first franciscans yeah you know like job job was given everything he lost you know yeah he did get it back and so, so you think about that and you think um how do you live Right. Oh, it reminds me of what Jesus. I'm sort of practical. Let's see, and I like to eat. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It reminds me of what uh, Jesus said. Uh, no, Foxes have holes. That one. No, yeah. I don't remember. Well, what I was thinking about. Do is, not store up. Oh, do not store up wealth in heaven, or or it on earth, mm -hmm. but treasures in heaven. And that was the position of Francis and Bernard, is that if they lay aside all of their riches, uh, then they'll have greater riches, not just in heaven, but, but with God. In this life, uh, they're giving over the burden. Of, one of the things that Francis said is, you know, the Pope pushed back a lot and said, are you really going to be able to live without anything? The Pope was also practical. He said, because you, you kind of need some things to live. Yeah. You're going to need a building. You're going to need, you're going to need some stuff. Exactly. And, and, and so the Pope said this to Francis when, when Francis brought his rule of life. And Francis said to the Pope, Father, Holy Father, if we have things, then we're going to have to defend them. And we don't want to defend them. And so there was a there was a sense of freedom in being able to give up everything, because all of a sudden it wasn't your responsibility to try to hold on to things and to keep others from taking them. Instead, you hold everything with open and loose hands and sometimes there's something there for you to use and sometimes there's not sometimes people will take it out of your hand and in times like that. You don't have to fight them. You can say, well, it wasn't mine to begin with. So you can have it. It's pretty, it's not very practical, is it? No. Well, I, I, I just said it as a little confession, but I, I don't like this. Like this. I don't like this. Because, uh, you know, all these wonderful responsibilities, you know, parents, children, right. children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, like <laughs> I was young. But, um, my grandchildren now are all out and have jobs and are, um, you know, have boyfriends, girlfriends, all that kind of thing. So I can see sort of the future. My son and his daughter, his wife, and other friends, they seem to be settled somewhere. And I thought, you know, really? Uh, I'm responsible to take care of certain home right now. Even if something happened, I would still want to help. But the responsibility of it is no longer mine. And that's something you really want, something that is a real lesson to you. But you yeah. have to, you, you don't have to do that anymore. You have to give them the opportunity to do this. There's a real life lesson there. For some people, that's a really hard transition, isn't it? To let go of responsibility yes. especially yeah. because we find often we find our worth and purpose mm -hmm. in the things we do and that was another thing that francis 
uh, pursued is that our identity is not in what we do or especially what we have. Our, our identity comes from being children of God. And so letting go, that's a lesson of letting go. I preach a lot about letting go yes. from the pulpit. And, uh, and that's because of this Franciscan tradition. It's all about letting go and holding things loosely. Uh, it's not about not having anything. Francis ate, he was happy to eat. In fact, on his deathbed, he asked for his favorite cookies. Yes, almond. almond cookies, exactly. <laughs> but uh, he was perfectly okay with not having those things as well. Sometimes they were there, sometimes they weren't and his happiness his joy, his identity didn't depend on those things, which is powerful. Um, yeah. <laughs> so having given away, you know, moved out of the house, the farm, and then the department down in Pompano, I got rid of a lot of stuff. Yeah. But I held on to some expensive furniture, some old knickknacks I like to have in my freezer, and I don't know why. You know, nobody else wants them. Right. <laughs> So I still have three or four boxes that I have not unpacked in a year and a half. And I keep thinking, well, I'll put them online, maybe I'll get some money for it. But they just keep sitting there. So eventually I'm going to start to the little pennies. You know, right. Right. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. And eventually I can't afford to live where I am because I'm just increasing the, <laughs> the amount of money per month. It's a process. You know, and I'm looking, I look at certain things now because I know maybe about six months when I have to do this. I'm thinking, I don't even do the furniture, this and that. Nobody wants it. Nobody gave me much money for it. So I'm you know, just not giving away, you know, which is fine. But giving away the control is the hard part because 